Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series, your resource for the latest news and updates on pressing issues facing the accounting profession. Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. I'm Eric Ouskerson. It's great to be with the Town Hall community as we kick off 2023. It's fantastic to be in person yet again with you, Barry, Lisa, and Mark, as we're meeting with a with a group of firms. Thank you, Eric. Happy New Year to everybody, and it's great to be with you. And I, I would say if we had to make one bold prediction for 2023, it won't get boring. <laughs> <laughs> We've got plenty to discuss uh, in our town halls, so welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Happy New Year, everyone. And Mark will be kicking things off with you, and it's amazing. They're, they're, they're in session they are, in Washington, D.C. They're trying to be in session, Eric. <laughs> they're trying. So let's get right into it. Uh, we've got a power hour for you. We're going to kick things off with uh, Mark Peterson, uh, who leads the advocacy area of the AICPA with a DC and profession update. Then Lisa is going to give us a review of some of the hot topics, a couple of hot topics in the tax area. And then we're going to do an outlook, uh, talk a little bit about strategies uh, for 2023. I know you're all thinking about how to make this year better than the last. So we're going to give you some of our insights and we're going to have a practitioner discussion. And then we always close uh, with the open forum and we welcome, we welcome your questions. So uh, please bring them to us. Here's the lineup for today. Uh, we'll introduce them as they uh, join the show. So to kick things off, Mark, uh, look at this. I mean, we we almost be publishing a news article every hour on the hour related to the Speaker of the House. So what's the latest? Well, they're going into their eighth round of votes, which we have not seen since around the Civil War. So wow, <laughs> this is this is unprecedented in recent history, obviously. Um, but basically, what's going on is um, the the Speaker of the House is elected by the majority, assuming they have enough votes. Kevin McCarthy put himself forward; uh, he does not have a vote. And each time that there is not a clear majority, it goes to another round. Last time we saw two rounds was like 1923. So now we're closing in on eight. Um, this is very significant because of the potential impact that it's going to have on our legislation that we're prioritizing. And I'll get into that in a second. But just a little about what's going on around um, the, the campaign that McCarthy has to be speaker. There have been a group of about 20 Republicans that have said that they will not vote for him. Usually that is to negotiate for some compromises. Uh, the compromises could be individual committee seats. They could, the compromises could be things that they would like in a rules package. The rules package is not enacted until the speaker is elected. Right now, the House of Representatives does not have any members. They're all members elect. Mm -hmm. so all they can do is very narrowly vote for the speaker and maybe some administrative things. Um, so this, in order for the House to begin its work, there has to be a speaker elected. So they're going to probably work through this negotiation. They, they, the rumors are that they're going to uh, adjourn for the day after this eighth round, mm -hmm. and then they will go into rooms and they will make phone calls and they will try and figure out how to either find a different candidate that could garner the majority, mm -hmm. or they will put together a package that will bring along enough votes and a large enough coalition for uh, Kevin McCarthy from California to get the votes to be speaker. And then they can start to work. They can't in introduce legislation or have a legislative vote until there's a speaker to swear them in. We got a lot of comments coming in, Mark. I mean, is, was this a surprise? I mean, did anyone predict that we were going to be doing eight votes it's, it's, and spending two to three days on this? Eight is a surprise, I will tell you. We have seen as the as the, as the margins have gotten smaller in between the two parties, uh, and we have seen historically there have been some protest votes against the speaker, voting against your own leadership or withholding a vote or voting for another candidate, but it's never been the margin. And we certainly have never gone you know, in recent history, obviously, eight rounds. Yeah, and I think the eight is finished. It may not be certified yet, but right. essentially it's, it's uh, they'll probably adjourn or whatever today. But I, I do think it's, I think there's a couple of interesting nuances. And Mark, you touched on one is they, they, they technically are not members of the right. House. Um, they're still technically, uh, you know, representative elects. And um, that's just a, it's just I find that a very sort of technical nuance, but very interesting that, you know, these folks, if you think about it, if you are on either party, this is a non party point. Um, if you are a newly a member, elected member of the House and you, your family's there and you're there to be sworn in and all of those things, who knows how long you've been focused on trying to get elected. 
it, none of that has happened. You've not been sworn in and all of those things now for, for a series of days. It's a pretty interesting, I think, observation. I do think, though, from, you know, and obviously the people in this town hall, they're people on different sides of the political spectrums and things of that nature. I, I do think it is, it is really symbolic in a lot of ways of, a, of an incredibly lack of functioning government process that we have. And, and, it, and, and you can't blame one side or the other. There, there are parts of it on both sides. Um, and, you know, I don't, you know, people say there should be compromise. May, they're going to have to be compromise in this, whether it's compromise on the Republican side alone or across the aisle will be a big, big, big news item. Because if the Republican Party goes to the Democratic side to get enough votes to get McCarthy elected, that will be the headlines that people will be reading, et cetera. Um, but there are also a lot of people that, you know, say that there needs to be some kind of coalition at, or at least working across the aisle. So it'll be interesting to see. Well, we can spend a lot of time on this, Mark, but we've got a few other items we want no, to talk about. So when they do get the whole, the form, the 118th Congress, you know, some of the top issues. <laughs> I think, well, these are our key issues. And I yeah. think, I think what the biggest takeaway from what's going on with the election of the speaker uh, and Barry's right, you know, either party, they've got to figure out how to move forward. But we have seen less and less productivity coming out of Congress over the years. Uh, some people could say that's great, uh, but there are some must pass things like debt limits and, and budgets that we have to get done. Um, but there are also some of the professions initiatives. And, you know, a, a week end of this year, we're looking at the, what we're going to be teeing up as our initiatives going into Congress. Um, some of them we're, are, we're just observing. Some of them are, could be some challenges to us. Um, but just a couple examples. I, I got to tell you, I think this fiscal state of the nation resolution that we've been pushing for several years now, which really puts forces Congress to focus on the financial statement of the U.S. government, is going to get. It's gotten traction. It's gotten attention uh, as we've refocused on debt and deficit. I think it's going to get more. And as you can see by the narrowness of the majorities. Um, I think it'll be, could easily be included in a discussion around budgets and debt and deficit. And and just to to for our our participants to understand what this fiscal state of the nation resolution does is it focuses on the accrual basis financial statement of the federal government. And any time you hear a number in the media or in, on you know news in any form or fashion about the deficit, generally today it's in the twenty something trillion dollar way a, a trillion. The reality is on a cruel basis, it's a much larger number. And what we have said, and this would be a joint resolution of both houses, it's passed the house before, yeah. and, it re and it would require a process in which the Congress would come together and actually look at, digest, if you will, understand that the accrual basis financial statements produces a much different and worse situation. Yeah, it, it, we've gotten attention. I think it's only going to grow. Uh, obviously, we're going to keep up our focus on IRS taxpayer services. Uh, that's a you know bipartisan issue. But it also you know there's a lot of focus on the IRS that's been critical. Um, a lot of the you know eighty billion dollars that was focused on enforcement has been challenged. We need more focus on service. We know that um, digital assets, crypto, right? We're going to see legislation that could be a bipartisan. Of the things that I think could move alone in a bipartisan way, I would put that on the list because, you know, with FTX, there's going to be a renewed focus, a renewed focus. There's been one, but it'll be a renewed focus on crypto, um, ESG we've talked about. Interestingly, on cannabis, very closely to the very end of the negotiation for the year-end deal, there was legislation that was very close to being included that would have actually resolved the issue for for financial institutions, for accountants, and for lawyers related to the federal state conflict. Um, independent standard setting for us is always an issue. Congress wants to engage. Uh, that's another place that we're going to absolutely have to keep a focus. And Mark, the mobile workforce taxation bill, which is hard to get done, but it, it is in the world we live in today. Makes total sense. With, and basically, again, what that bill does is says that if you're moving in a for a short of period of time, 30 days or so, you don't have to do state tax allocation among the different states that you're in. Right. And it it has come close to passing and it's been a big push for a long time. But in today's world, it really is something that is just practical and needs to be looked at. It makes total sense. And actually, if you look at this list, it's there's nothing particularly partisan. These are mostly 
bipartisan and bicameral House and Senate initiatives. Mm -hmm. It's really going to depend on a functioning Congress, which is where we started, right. so that they can the process works and um, legislative vehicles are moving. Well, Mark, they they did get something done right before the year ended. We were taught we talked about this at the last town hall, but the bill had not passed. So I think it passed, you know, on the last Friday of the year. Well, it's funny when they, they actually do get stuff done when they really, really want to go home. <laughs> right. um, so a significant piece of legislation, uh, 1.7 trillion, lots of different bells and whistles on it from, um, from our perspective. Some of it was obviously funding the government, which was, you know, why they were still there that close to the holiday. Uh, significant piece of retirement legislation was was added to it that Lisa's going to go through. Um, budget cut to the IRS. This is interesting. Mm -hmm. So in the IRA, uh, they gave the IRS $80 billion, but most of it for enforcement. But in the year end bill, they actually cut like $1.7 billion. Part of that was because they had to negotiate between the two parties mm -hmm. and the Republicans were focused critically mm -hmm. on the IRS. And that was a concession. So it kind of sets up how we think the House is going to be looking at the IRS going forward. Um, some of the things that didn't make it in, I already mentioned cannabis, um, unfortunately tax extenders. Uh, there was not a significant tax title or a lot of tax issues that were included in the package. Um, dealing with the tax extenders is one that we always look for. That, that is a possibility depending on, again, the, the functioning of Congress that we could see another opportunity for depending on the um, depending on the vehicles that we're seeing. And then the Form 1099-K fix. Yeah, we're going to cover that in a minute. Yeah. A very big one. <laughs> that wasn't it. It was out, but it, it, it was addressed. So we'll hit that. We, we yeah, got we it addressed it. a different way, but it didn't yeah. make it into right. the legislature. That's great. And then the last one I'll say is there's there's a series of, of bills that we're watching and actually some regulatory action related to any money laundering that could have an impact on the profession in a negative way, uh, creating unreasonable burden. And we're going to be addressing that in future town halls. Okay. Well, we've got, we've got an active group here, Lisa, just close to 9,000 exactly. attendees to, to kick off 2023. So we got, you got some good news here. Absolutely. Um, the, the year end miracle continued, we got a budget passed and we got, um, a 1099 K delay. So it's important to understand this is simply a one-year delay that IRS granted on December 23rd. And so I've given you a link to the notice. They, the FAQs are really helpful too. So I've given you a link to those. But we're now back to where we were for um, the historic reporting, which is your clients won't be getting a 1099K unless they have um, $20,000 or more in transactions um, and 200 actual transactions. So if they meet those qualifications, then they will get a 1099K, but it was $600 regardless of the number of transactions. It is not a permanent fix, and we're going to have lots of advocacy efforts to continue to improve that $600 threshold. But it's important to understand that you can use this time to help your clients get ready if there is no fix. So you've got this one year delay, start getting your clients educated about the record keeping that they need to be doing. They should have been doing this all along because there were, a lot of these transactions may be taxable if it is a, a business related transaction. Um, but I, you know, Mark, I know your team did a lot of advocacy around no, this issue. We, we made a lot of noise and uh, going into that year end deal because we saw the vehicle, we got a lot of attention in Congress, we're going to parlay that in the next year to focus on it. Well, we've got this one year reprieve for free. But it's gonna again being trying to find the vehicle to fix it. But this is the kind of thing that we're gonna be reaching out to the town hall community to to uh, be reaching out to their members of Congress. I think there's a communication point that you make, Lisa, is is, is absolutely right. Uh, we know it's a divided government and it's gonna be very difficult to see much legislation pass. So, finding a vehicle that addresses this legislatively. And remember, this was enacted legislatively. Uh, and the IRS is, is delaying it sort of through an administrative procedure, but that's not a permanent delay. And, you know, it, it, it does encompass all these transactions that are not in a trade in, a trader business. Um, and the whole reporting notion versus the reconciliation process with the IRS is going to be very complicated. And um, so you're not going to have that complication now 
But I think it's very important to start the education process with your clients, because if it comes back around a year from now, you have been on the front end of making those points to the client and making them aware of it. Yeah. Um, we've also, we talked a little bit earlier in, in Mark's session about uh, the tax return backlog of the IRS service levels. So TIGTA came out with a report late in the month and basically, no surprise to any of us, highlighted the, the continuing backlog at the IRS. As of December 16, the IRS was reporting about 2 million individual returns still in their backlog. And um, before y'all ask, 900 um, uh, for the 941 Xs, about 371,000 in their backlog. So making some progress, but still not what was um, the goal for the IRS in terms of getting back to a healthy level of inventory. And that's going to impact your clients. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit when Carla McCall joins us about how to communicate with your clients about some of those service level service issues at the IRS. Some other things that came out uh, during the last couple of weeks is um, a delay in digital asset brokerage reporting. This does not change the requirement for taxpayers to report their income received from digital asset transactions. But there was a lot of confusion about um, definition of a brokerage, def definition of transactions that were to be reported by brokers. So the IRS came out and said, we're going to delay that reporting um, requirement until we come out with additional guidance. So some good news there. K2, K3, we talked about the good news that came out over the last couple of town halls, but I wanted to let you know that we've got some updated resources for you in, um, in the tax section, including a, a sample communication that you can send to clients about the foreign tax reporting um, issues that we've been talking about for the last few months. So good news there. At least at the point I'm about the brokerage doesn't change the tax, the ultimate tax uh, treatment is, is also true on the 1099K area. Right. So, I mean, if there are non-business gains that are out there, technically, even though there's not any reporting, it is, it is obviously still taxable. Yeah, exactly. A few other things to talk about really quickly. Uh, you probably already know this. Just pointing out that we've got a J Journal of Accountancy article that talks about the updated IRS mileage rate. And um, a couple of other quick things to hit is, um, let's, um, if you can skip to the next slide. There we go. Secure Act 2.0. So I've saw some questions coming in. Did it pass? Yes, it's included in the legislation that passed at the end of December with the $1.7 trillion, trillion dollar bill that we talked about. There are a lot of details within the Secure Act 2.0. I picked out a few that I thought um, would, would catch your attention. The most obvious one that a lot of people have asked about is an increase in the beginning age for required minimum distributions. So then the, the um, age is now um, 73, which is a, a, a change of one year. And then after December 1, 31, 2032, it's gonna go to 75. A lot of other provisions in there, it's really designed to um, provide a lot of streamlining, expanding coverages, increasing retirement savings, simplifying, clarifying retirement plan rules. Um, a lot of interest in tax-free rollovers from your Section 529 education savings accounts to Roth IRAs. A lot of planning opportunities for your clients within Secure Act 2.0. We will have a lot of resources that we'll be developing for you. There'll be a podcast coming out in the next week or two. We'll be developing continuing education. But for now, I wanted to highlight some of the things I thought were relevant and point you to that Journal of Accountancy article that's going to give you um, a, a bigger detail. Yeah, and probably the, as of all of that $1.7 trillion bill, these, these sort of elements are the most planning oriented ones from a practitioner perspective. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of opportunity in our um, PFP section is already developing resources to, to help you with those conversations. All right, um, a shuttered venue operator grant update for your for-profit clients who received this SVOG. As a reminder, we were through, through some advocacy efforts 
we were able to get the SBA to allow a compliance examination engagement rather than a, a full scope audit. So our Governmental Audit Quality Center, GAQC, has provided some illustrative reports and schedules that you can use. So wanted to make sure that you, we call those out for you if you've got those for-profit clients who got the SVOG money. All right, so with that, we're gonna move into some, some practice some strategies practice 2023. Strategies. Yeah. So, uh, well, and that's what the town hall is all about. At times, you know, we we bring you the, the latest breaking news is, and we just, we talked about what was happening in DC and some key technical updates, but we also really appreciate the opportunity to discuss best practices and trends that we're seeing with firms and, and members and business and industry. So Barry, you know, kicking things off, we've been talking to a lot of firms this week about some of the key trends that they're seeing coming out of digital CPA. Um, these are three primary ones. It's it's digital transformation. You know, for the deck for a decade, we've been talking about the move to the cloud. It's much more than just that. It's really building digital networks, leveraging automation. And we're also seeing a greater gap in what high performing teams are doing compared to just average performing teams. And in this hybrid world, when you have to think about digital transformation, high performance just matters. And that just brings us to this, this final uh, trend here. And it's just ongoing strategies in evolution of business models. And when you think about digital transformation, I think about all the firms I talked to at Digital CPA last month, the key to success with digital transformation is the strategy. I mean, technology is the enabler and it's the investment in those strategies and rethinking the business models by you know good performing teams that are really making a lot of impact. Right, and the business models are really critical. We've done a lot of speaking about that around the country and, and on these town halls and other places. And we are seeing an evolution of how firms sort of structure themselves. And I'm not talking about private equity ownership and things of that nature, but how they structure, how they're gonna deliver services and set the expectations up. And it's happening in all different size firms. We've had practitioners in very, very small firms, you know, talk about some of these things, how they've changed bill, billing models as an example and, yep. and how they service different clients. Um, I, you know, I think the overall, if you wanna think about it from the, I guess at the, at the macro level, what, what the digital transformation is doing is it's really changing, I would say, the shape of the firm. And by that, I mean how human capital is deployed. And we all know there are challenges in human capital in general. But, um, you know, there's, there's traditionally been our firms, have, even if it's a very small firm, it's basically pyramid shape. And we're seeing that evolve in, into something that, that I like to call, you know, a fat middle in it with a, sort of a narrower base. And that is because with digital capabilities, the level of work and how you're deploying teams is changing, which is a business model, a business model, you know, thought process of how you deploy or where you layer in people from a leverage perspective. Um, and of course, with that comes, you know, how you build and, and how you leverage. And the high performing teams, that, just a comment on that, because you, you, you make a, a great point on that. You know, people who have, again, people who have been in these town halls, speak about practice management issues. Um, for decades, we have struggled and talked about in this profession, the notion about how people evaluate personnel, how they give constructive feedback, how they elevate the expectations of people in a very constructive way. Um, it, it is sort of almost, you know, that, that goal, if you will, is sort of exacerbated today by, by a generation of people who are in the, you know, in the early parts of their career who thrive on that feedback, who want that feedback to, to improve. But it, as, you know, there are certainly exceptions to this, but there, there are a lot of examples in the profession where you know, the people in the profession are not really good at giving that sort of performance enhancement type of feedback. And so I think it's a theme that you will see as firms continue to wrestle with. How do you support partners? How do you support each other in the management of a firm to really try to, to elevate that feedback and that performance from the people you do have. And because retention is a very critical component of this process as well. And all of this is, it really is a multi-year effort. When we're talking about talking to a firm and it's firms of all sizes, it can be a small firm, 
and they're really feeling like they're hitting high performance levels, it's because of that upscale, upskilling investment over many years, coaching relationships, same thing with the digital transformation and the evolving strategies. And I know we've been talking about talent during a lot of these town halls and culture, but when, when these three elements are really working and I'm looking forward to bringing Lisa and Carl into this discussion, it really addresses the talent and culture issue and the feeling of engagement. So sometimes you can talk about culture, but you know, sometimes it's better to think about your investment in the technology platform. What do you need to do to upskill the, the, the teams in the evolution of the strategies? Yeah, and the only thing I would add on your long-term deal, and, and we'll, we'll get some additional feedback, and I think this applies to all size firms as well, is yes, it is multiple year. And, don't, and you know, I would just encourage people, the old axiom, you know, uh, don't fail because of your pursuit of perfection. And I, it won't be perfect, but it's, it's progress in those types of things. And no better time than to start all this than the beginning of, of 23. So Lisa, let you introduce Carla. Yeah, that was all a perfect lead into the conversation Carla and I are going to have. Carla McCall is managing partner of AIF CPA. She's going to tell you a little bit about her firm. But I've been lucky enough to get to meet Carla over the last few years. She was on the PCPS um, executive committee, and now she's a member of the AICPA board. So we were having a conversation about what she's been doing within her firm to try to reduce some of the busy season stress. So with that, Carla, welcome to your first AICK Town Hall. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your firm and um, then we'll have a conversation. Okay, thanks Lisa. So I have been with my firm for 27 years, and I think it's an important point because when I started with AAFCPAs, we were a small firm. So I have been part of the journey to get to a regional size firm. We're about 300 total employees now, and I probably can do an entire session on the lessons learned along the way. Um, but really, when Lisa asked me to talk about this, you know, one of the things that I've that we have done over the years is made assumptions about what is causing our team members stress. And so what I have learned is in order to alleviate stress and improve, we need to get to the root cause of what's causing it. And so we have talked to our team members and surveyed. And for us, it comes down to three categories, automation, leverage, and client management. I can expand on those a little bit. I think our, our um, attendees are going to be really interested in some of the automation improvements that you've done. Let's sure. start there. Okay. So as far as automation, we've spent, uh, you know, as far as the tax taxis and the tax software, there's a lot of tools out there you can, you can um, put together for automation. So we're using the usual suspects. Tax Caddy, where clients can take pictures with their mobile phone and it comes to us electronically. It links in with SurePrep and then also safe send for electronic. But really where we focused the last 18 months to two years is on creating the digital firm. And so not automa automating paper process of how we, how we were doing something, but really taking a digital first view. And so we're working with a company called Digilance that is creating firm uh, digital first firm process. And last tax season, we piloted their last mile filing process, which is bot infused technology. So where uh, clients would send e-file release forms to an email box, we had uh, someone who had to check the e email box several times a day over the course of tax season, download the form, file it, go into the tax software, release it. This software actually does that automatically. And so it constantly checks that email box and it'll move everything, release the returns, it'll file it, and then also move in our workflow software. So it's really looking at the technology that can uh, really just improve that process and free up our people time so they can spend it on higher and best use. We're moving this, and we've been part of their beta uh, this entire year, helping them improve the product. And so it'll be more improved for this tax season, as well as uh, starting to use their automated engagement letter process. That's great. But I think you hit on a key point, which is you're leveraging your people to do higher value work. And you're also looking at who's doing what work. Right. And I just want to make two points, because one is we think automation is just making our current process electronic. and it is not. It's really saying, if I was creating this today from scratch, how would I build it? Most likely, it's not how we've been doing it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a that's a really good 
um, thing to, to think about. If you were do, building your firm from scratch, how would you be uh, using workflow tools? How would you be um, managing client communications? And who would be doing what work? Yeah, and the second point is, as our firms grow, we need to always have an external view because the systems we use are going to change. And so we need to understand as, as we grow, you know, what do, how, what do we want to change? Are there new tools out there? So we need to have somebody that's focused on that. That's great. Um, in terms of the right people doing the right work, what mm. what's your approach been to that? Yeah. So what I've realized with leverage is we've been really great at leveraging partner time with an assistant or an executive assistant. But when you look at where the work is in a lot of the administrative work, it sits in our middle. You're talking about the middle, Barry. Seniors, supervisors, managers. We realize that there's a lot of work that they could leverage to uh, administrators. So we actually created a project specialist role. We have them throughout our firm. And this, uh, the, this group can use them and train them on projects. So billing, engagement letters, contacting clients, getting data. So all those things, will, if they can leverage that, will free them up to be used at their highest and best use, which is working with our clients and really helping them solve problems and, and consult. And so that has been very valuable throughout our firm is that project specialist role. And that gives your team the opportunity to dig deeper in with their clients and have a more meaningful relationship with the client rather than it just being, hey, give me your W-2, you left one off. That's right. Okay. And it also keeps work moving because let's face it, when it comes down to whether it's administrative work or client service, we're always going to put client service first. And so mm -hmm. sometimes things lag, but having that dedicated position supporting us, it moves more timely. And I've talked with smaller firms who are doing this as well. So this isn't just a, a larger firm opportunity. There are smaller firms that are um, working with the existing administrative staff that they may have to talk to their teams about how they can bring in that administrative support into the, the workflow at a, at a different level than maybe had traditionally been done. So don't think you've got to go, oh my gosh, it's, a, it's January 5th, I can't go hire three new people to just do this um, project specialist work. Are there opportunities within your administrative staff to, to use them differently as well? Um, another key component is clients. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, man. Client management. Uh, yeah. So I, you know, and it's funny because I, when we talk to our team members about where the stress was for them, it was on process, clunky process. That's where the automation. It was about, geez, can I get help doing some of these other things that I could train anybody to do the leverage? You know, the third is really client management, and that sort of spans a, a few different categories. One is making sure that we have a robust uh, sort of resource management process where we're looking at how we're scheduling our clients, how uh, we look at a rebalance of, you know, how we're balancing the work among our team and also setting internal deadlines. But one of the processes we've put in place is a client retention committee uh, or a re client retention process where anybody in the firm can submit to the client retention process if they feel like we need to take an independent review of the client. And as we grow, you know, sometimes clients uh, might not always be uh, the right fit for, for differing reasons. But we've taken a, a and, and this, the, the results of this uh, committee results in a few different things. One, we need to right size the fee. Two, we need to have a reset meeting with our clients about uh, timing and things like that. Three, uh, it would be the clients that we tend to schedule during tax season, but they never get a, their, us their stuff. And so it, we might just say, you know what, we're going to do your returns in June. So smoothing out the work because they don't all have to get done during that busy time or four, moving them along and being able to, you know, say we you know we've out we've outgrown you or we're not the right fit anymore and going through that process it's very hard for engagement partners who have had long-term relationships to do that so we've created a process to take it out of their hands and take an independent view with a committee around that and we've actually developed some pretty close relationships with some sole proprietors 
who are actually looking to build their book of business. And so we have nicely referred other practitioners and they love it because in these cases, you know, our fees have been more than what they were charging. And so it's a nice upgrade to their own practice. And it's a nice way to hand off to a trust another trusted advisor. So I think those relationships between larger size firms and smaller size firms can be very valuable on both sides. Yeah. Um, it's a, uh, as, as you well know, it's, it's a live show. We got a lot of questions coming yeah. in. So just <laughs> a lot of gold that in that, uh, best practices that you're, you're providing here. Just a couple of follow-ups. So first on the product, you called it a product specialist, some people say project specialist, you know, a little bit more about the type of role here, accountant type, admin staff. So okay. maybe some describe that a little bit more. And then also the the service that you're using to do that full digital first look at your firm. Just state the name of that again. Okay. So as far as the project specialist role, they are not accountants. They are strong administrators. And in fact, some of our best project specialists are actually have come from other industries. They're just super organized and really smart. And so we've had people who have come in from early childhood education. We have people who are recent graduates from business administration major. That's the type of background. But I think when you're looking for them, you want to really focus on the competencies. So it's really about organizational skills, communication, and sort of that project management, the multitasking, because they'll be trained on specific projects, but they'll, they'll be doing them over the course of, of the year, but also just communicate. They may communicate with clients. We have them communicate with clients or other team members. So I think the communication is really important. So if you're thinking about that, just think of tying it to the competencies that are important to you. The company that we're using for the automation is Digilance, okay. and uh, it's a startup, but they're creating some pretty cool stuff, and um, uh, you can search them. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, what we'll do with the Resource Center, and even our next town hall, there's a number of companies kind of in this category. We can we could give a number of different options for sure, right. one of the firms related to thinking about how to better digi digitize their tax practice. So one of the things Carla mentioned was, um, are, are you working with the right clients? And we've talked in the past about the, the situation where it might it may no longer be the right fit. So what is what is the process for saying, it's not you, it's me? And I want to make sure that you know that there are sample engagement letter or sample disengagement letters, and there are some um, risk uh, risk management. Um, policies and procedures that you can put in place. On the last town hall, I referred to a CNA ebook that um, has some tax season or busy season prep resources in it. That's going to be a great resource for you if you need to go ahead and have some of those meetings right now. Um, the other thing that we talked about was um, right sizing fees and are you getting much pushback on on fee increases? Yeah. Well, I I guess um, I want to make a point on your you, that you just made about the letters because I firmly believe how we exit a client is just as important as how we get a client, and so it it has it needs attention and it needs the right communication and we have varying templates um, about that. I will say on the fee piece. The clients that value us, um, that value our advice, that probably are buying multiple services, are the ones that understand the value. And I think if you have clients that understand your value, that conversation is a little bit easier. In other cases where they're viewing it more as just, it's just a tax return, I just need you to get my tax, which is probably not the right fit for our firm. And this, this, these criteria are going to be different for each firm, um, but for our for for, for for example, in our firm, for individual returns, they have to be a client of our uh, wealth management and working with our CFPs and getting our integrated services. You know, if they're not, they're probably not the right fit for us anymore. And so we talk to them about that process. So I think we've been getting some pushback, but not as much as I would have thought. Yeah. So that's all part of the client client communication, helping your client understand how how the work actually gets done within your firm why it's important that they meet those deadlines 
and the work involved. Yeah, we're very candid with our clients about how we manage our business, right? They need to understand how we schedule our people, that we don't have people waiting for work to come in the door, right? We're trying to plan the balance and the workflow. So when they don't follow through on their end, they have to understand that there's a consequence to that, whether it's not meeting a deadline or whether it's charging them more money or whatever that is. And I feel like if we don't, if we're not candid, about our process and appreciation for how we do our work, we're not gonna deliver the best service. And we have to make sure we're keeping our service standards high. Right. And so we've actually developed slides for reset meetings with clients so that we can have that conversation to say, here's our expectation, what's your expectation? Let's get on the same page and let's agree. This way, if it doesn't follow through, then we, you know, we at least we've had that joint communication. Great point. Um, so it is January 5th. Some firms may not have time to implement some of these automation um, tools that you've talked about, or they may not um, be in a position to hire those, um, those new folks to try to leverage some of their skills. So what can they be doing now? Well, I mean, now they can at least, if they haven't talked to their team members or surveyed their team members, they certainly could survey their team members to find out what are, you know, what are they nervous about? What are the stressors for them? Because if we know that up front, then we can manage it as we go. And I found a lot of firms, you know, are still making the assumptions about what it is. Oh, we need a massage therapist to come in. Well, that's not going to reduce stress if that's not the root cause of the stress. So talking to the team members about that so they can manage it as they go is, is one item. Yeah. Um, and, and sticking to the deadlines that you've set with your clients. Right. Would that help? Yes. Internal deadlines for sure. And making sure we're on the same page as a team as to how we're going to manage those when they don't happen. Right. Carla, there's been a lot written to just pick up on the survey and then designing, mm -hmm. you know, actions against the root cause. Um, there's been a lot of talk today in today's times about sort of diversity of the answers that there is not a single answer for staff. I'm wondering how you deploy that. So it's not the, what might be the right answer for person A or staff person A could be totally different from B, C, and D. And you might have to have multiple answers to that process. How do you deal with that? Well, I, we spent a lot of time on uh, understanding the di diversity of people and what natural preferences are through a process we call type coach. It's basically the personality profiles. So we are keenly aware of the differences of how people want to work. But we are moving toward more of a concierge staff process, right? Who, you know, how people want to work and do they want to be remote or do they want to be in the office and how do they learn? Are they a visual learner? Are they not? And everybody is different. So it gets pretty complicated. Uh, you know, I think it's the having those candid conversations. We happen to have talent advisors in our firm, so they support that process. I know that's something that can be um, purchased sort of on a contract basis for, for smaller firms if they don't have the resources to hire it in. Um, but, it, you know, I think it's just educating people about it's not one size fits all. But today it's one size fits all. Right. Which is great. The second question is, as you were talking about the clients, um, we have a lot of work that we've done in the tax the transformation and evolution of tax area. Is we talk about the the younger generation who will be buying tax services will think about tax services differently. We use the term that they will think of instead of, a, uh, of going to a CPA firm to get a product, a tax return, that the tax return actually becomes a byproduct of a different type of relationship. Mm. Now, you can describe it in a lot of different ways, but that sounds like a lot of what you're doing with the reset aspect with the clients and the expectations, because it's one level client that just sees you as providing that product. Right. And, and I wonder if there's lessons learned in the process to help people who are dealing with these things as they sort of communicate with clients to really think about it as, you know, the tax return is really just a byproduct of what we're trying to achieve with you, which is minimization of tax or a different financial outcome or things that get characterized in a different way. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think integrated services is important. That's where we focus. So we, I mean, we have to add value to our clients and our value is not keying in their data into a tax software and producing a report. 
it's our insights about uh, the future and what's happening and what tax planning ideas do we have? And oh, how's your financial plan? And have you, you know, have you looked at your financial plan and when do you want to retire? And so we connect our tax practice to our financial planners, to our estate planning, so that, and that's our ideal client. Our ideal client is coming to us for that value added. And not even just in the tax side, um, even on the, if you look on the insurance side, our clients are looking to us for helping them with insights on efficiency and uh, ideas and new tools and how to do more with less. Are there, are there systems we could be using that would save us time? Is there bot technology or automation that they could implement so they can redeploy their people again on higher and best use work? And so I think for firms, we wanna make sure we're focused on the value added to our clients and that's in our advice and what we know and what we bring to the table and that we always have them on our mind it's not in producing the product and i think we all no matter what size firm i mean that's that's what we love to do and that's what we have the skills to do yeah. um, well let me just talk, ask a couple of questions regarding trends here uh, barry i'll ask this to you first and carla you can definitely uh, add to Barry's answer. You know, here is a question about M&A. We're, we're seeing a fair number of firm mergers acquisitions in our area. You know, what's that trend look like nationwide? Are some of the drivers of this, you know, the human, human resources as well as tech? Well, the trends in that area are up. <laughs> there is a lot of activity in M&A. There's a lot of drivers to it. Um, tech and the investment in tech is, is certainly a driver. Aging population of partners is a, is a driver. Um, some, to some degree, human capital in general is a driver. Um, this, the complexity of, of, of the world is a driver. Sustained growth is a driver. One of the things that I look at from a profession-wide perspective is that when the profession is doing very well, and when you take the, the, the totality of the profession and you look at you know, the, let's say the, the total revenue of all, you know, public accounting firms combined to continue to hit growth targets, which everybody has growth targets on that collective is a big, big number compared, you know, coming out of the economy as a whole. And it's a really, really big number. And then you can segment that into different sizes. And we do do that. And so that makes making some of those continual year after year after year growth targets very difficult to meet. And so mergers are also driven on that because it's, they're driven on the notion that I need growth in my firm to be able to have salary increases and pay, you know, insurance cost increases, et cetera. And, or I have to find a way to look at the merger process because that changes some of the cost structure to the revenue equation which allows that to occur. So those are all drivers. There's another big driver that, that's a little scarier in this, and we do a lot of work with futurists, et cetera. Almost every vertical industry, you can take restaurants, you can take banks, you can take manufacturing, and professional services firms aren't exempted from this. Through a maturity process, the, the, the squeeze occurs at a certain size element where you're, you're not big enough to be in the big, and you're too big to be in the small. And, and if you can think of it as an hourglass, right? You think about it, I'll just use a restaurant as an example. Everybody has their favorite restaurant. Sometimes it's a favorite pizzeria or Italian restaurant or whatever. But, you know, they might be family owned and it's down the block. We, but it's pretty easy for that entrepreneur to run that restaurant. Maybe they can even run two restaurants. But when they try to run six, it's really complicated and hard to do. And where the leverage comes in on a bunch of restaurants is at 50 or 100 or 500 and that's at the top end at the bottom end is that family restaurant that's operating one place so the person that's trying to run six gets into that squeeze in that particular vertical and you can think about it in retail manufacturing well it also applies in professional services firms it's that how do you get big enough to get the technologies to deploy the people to have a different conversation with clients as carla is talking about or how can you be niched enough at the lower end to be successful and have the sustained growth? And I think, I think thinking strategically like that is, is one of the things that's driving a lot of that mergers and acquisition activity. 
Yeah, I mean, I I, I agree. I, I think there's different reasons. I think succession could be a reason um, for the M and A, and certainly what we're going through in transformation right now. We need reserves, mm -hmm. and we need to be of a size where we have the the uh, ability to invest in what we need to invest in order to keep up with what's happening with digital transformation. I do think it it is a people play. Uh, that that it's about talent in some cases, because mm -hmm. uh, I know some mergers that have happened or acquisitions where they're getting rid of a segment of work and keeping the people. And it's about they're more interested in the team and the people that's coming than necessarily the work. And so, I, you know, I think it depends on mm -hmm. on the firm, but certainly have seen an increase in our market. Absolutely. And, and, and as I said, it's multiple aspects, but not to be misconstrued in anything I said. I think there will always be a role in the profession of, of small sole proprietor type um, firms. Mm. And I think technology actually helps enable that as well. Uh, and those niching is, is always is, is an important part. The most successful element of that will be where you can niche or you have a certain type of client, maybe a certain industry, a certain expertise that you can bring so that you can create that leverage point, even though it's not a big firm, but it's a targeted type of service. And you can look at the medical profession and you, you know, there's not a lot of general practitioners today. You know, that is the same type of evolution that occurs in that space. So by describing that hourglass, there is a base there of small firms that can be very, very, very successful, even though we are seeing to answer the question directly, very high numbers of mergers and equity. Well, Barry, you know, I, I always like to say that technology is a great equalizer. That's and right. and right. when we just came back from Digital CPA, a thousand uh, attendees, firms of all sizes, niche is important. So you, you can be a small small firm providing tax services, providing client accounting services, and doing it in a special category mm -hmm. and actually succeeding in some ways above firms much larger in size. So we're going to move now into, we're going to talk a little bit about having fun, Lisa, and then we're gonna, we're, we've are we kind of entered our open forum session. Yep. We'll do a few more questions, and then we've got some important closing resources for you. So we talked a little bit with Carla about um, some of the stress, and, and the answer to all stress is not just to bring in a massage therapist <laughs> once a week, but um, there are some ways to have, to lighten the mood a little bit during busy season. So PCPS has put together a calendar that you can download and put your logo on. This is a Word doc that you can adjust and edit, but we've tried to give you some ideas and some inspiration on how to take this to a, to another level. Um, but I'm going to vote for the massage therapist once a week. <laughs> I do need to, as we move into open forum, I do need to um, clarify something that um, I, I have to apparently take back all of my enthusiasm on 1099Ks and the lower reporting thresholds I've been asked to remind you that um, there may still be some, some providers who are not going to reprogram because this right. announcement came out so late in the calendar year. Um, there may be situations where you're, um, you were having backup withholding. And so the only way to report the backup withholding is through issuing that 1099K regardless of whether it meets that 20,200 transaction threshold. So it's a very good important point. What the IRS did took away the requirement, yes, but doesn't prevent. Yes, mm. that's a very important point. Yeah, so ball humbug. <laughs> <laughs> Most won't do it. <laughs> At least a lot of questions. We welcome the questions. A lot of questions coming in about resources, so we'll get that out, get answers out to those questions in the newsletter, as well as leveraging the new town hall portal. Here's a highlight of a number of resources related to the client advisory services area. Clearly one of the highest growth areas in, in, in the firm and very strategic. We just released our benchmarking survey, a lot of good information there. We're gonna have a webinar about that benchmarking survey on January 17th. If you're thinking about the CAS practice and or you wanna send some members of your team to a CAS workshop, we've got a CAS workshop that, that you can leverage and there's also just new opportunities there. There's an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal about just frustrations around expense reports. And there's a really new way to go about expense reporting. And that's actually to move to spend management, a whole new category. So mm -hmm. lots of resources you can leverage. 
So Lisa, we've got we've got just a couple minutes here, then we're going to cover a, a, a few more resources. One, so I'll just start here, and maybe Lisa, if you want to jump in with another question. Back to you, Carla. People, you, they've loved all of the insights uh, that you've provided today. And a question about overtime. So how what you're thinking on overtime and, and tax season, and and how, how does your firm manage that? So at the beginning of 2021, we actually got rid of recording admin time and non-billable time. So our people don't have to put that in at all because we weren't actually doing anything with it other than managing to a 40 hour week. And to us, it was, we, you know, everybody's a professional in our firm and it's so easy in our business to measure output, right? Cause we need to get work done and meet with clients. And, and so we're shifting our firm to really measuring output. So we've been really measuring billable time only. And we set goals for every individual in the firm and that's what we monitor. So the concept of overtime you know, is really just about the billable hours during the week and making sure the work is going. We don't have mandatory days or hours. We're a work from anywhere mm -hmm. firm. And so it's really about our teams managing their team's work and looking at that billable target. So do you so, pay overtime? You don't pay. We don't pay, pay overtime. But I think that that's question was. Oh, that's the question. Oh no. I mean, do, the thing is, I I mean, I've heard more and more from doing that. You're, you you want to know if someone's working eighty hours. Uh, and that's something you want to address in a different way. Yeah, I mean, we uh, we only pay overtime to our hourly employees, right. and they're not professional. We never have, and I've been at the firm for twenty seven years. We have bonus programs, right. so they can earn bonuses, and it's based on and not just on the work. It's other things they might. We have people who volunteer for automation initiatives and testing out a new technology. And so we take all that into consideration and there's annual bonuses. Okay. Lisa, questions? Um, I'll, I'll acknowledge a couple of questions that are coming in through the, the Q&A. Um, if you have not yet downloaded the slides, download the slides from the resources section because that gives you the live links to everything that we've, we've talked about today. Um, there are some resources where you will have to sign into the AICP, excuse me, the AICPA site. So download the slides. Um, as at, it's a PDF out there with with hyperlinks that'll get you to all of those things, and you're able to um, download the resources that we've talked about. Okay, thank you. So we'll let's just cover uh, some of these closing slides here. We've got in summary slide here. We we welcome you leveraging these slides, these town halls for your other members of your firm, as well as your clients. Uh, here's the recent AICPA town hall series. So you can you can leverage those. And this kind of, we have a webinar coming up that uh, connects with something that Carla said earlier. And this is about, you know, going beyond tax compliance with financial advisory services. And we're working on some tools and strategies to help you know, bring that discussion, that financial planning discussion into tax season. So here's a one hour uh, webinar coming up on January 11th uh, that you could take advantage of. So we talked about this uh, in December, we've launched this new AICPA town hall portal. Uh, we're over 500 questions today, thank you. So we take these questions into account, we, we organize them and we really try to post information both in the newsletter and we'll be working harder and harder at that this on on this town hall portal putting uh, answers to these questions and resources uh, which you can leverage we'll have our next town hall on thursday january 19th you can see we've got a full lineup uh sue coffee barry is going to be coming we've had some questions coming in related to uh to to talent and even the recent you know wall street journal article that was published over the holiday break. We've only we're in we're in the one minute zone here. So just some quick comments. Well, Sue's going to be in talking about some of the changes in CP exam called CP Evolution, which go into effect a year from now and do blueprints out and how that addresses some of the technology components. Um, and you know, there's a lot of work being done. She heads up our programs in those areas. Eight point plan nationally on dealing with human capital. It's a very complex part. We're part of a big ecosystem. The number of students in college, not just in accounting, but in everywhere, everywhere is down significantly. So it's a big, it's a, it's a big, our um, population as a whole, our, our economy as a whole challenge, not just for our profession. And well, thanks, Barry. So it'd be great to hear from Sue on all of that. And we're going to have 
our Aon team here talking about risk management practices. And I think we're going to be discussing a little bit about engagement letters. So here's the next two town halls. Uh, we, we had one town hall attendee uh, state that they were logging in from Antarctica. So. <laughs> wow, <laughs> there you that's go. a record. I think that is a record. <laughs> that's a record. <laughs> so Barry, maybe I'll let you have uh, closing remarks here as we uh, finish off our first uh, town hall of 2023. And, and my, my remarks are simple. Thanks all of you for participating. I agree with Eric on the questions. We feed that into what we do, how we do, how we communicate and, and give resources. And it, I think the beginning of the year is also a good time for me to thank our fantastic team, um, Eric, you and, and everyone else that really brings this um, to everyone that participates, nine, 10,000 people a week. It's a, it's a big job. And obviously, it is, is very important and very received from our members. So thank you as a participant and thank our team. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.